Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians. Each will be one to one. Today, we discuss no less than the future of the city, how it will look, feel, and even smell. How green can our city become? Will we be more congested? How do we cope with all the dreams of developers and city officials? These are the province of our guest, Hope Cohen, Deputy Director of the Center for Rethinking Development at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Welcome, Hope. Thank you so much, Cheryl. The center is under the auspices of the Manhattan Institute, which is a conservative think tank. What's the genesis for the center and what's its mission? Well, yeah, the Manhattan Institute as a, as a whole is, is known as and identified as a conservative think tank. It's, it, it has a pretty wide umbrella. The Center for Rethinking Development, I would say, does not have any kind of partisan point of view. Um, in, a, in a sense, it comes out of the tradi Mayor LaGuardia's tradition of there's no Democratic or Republican way of picking up the garbage. And similarly, you know, building and maintaining bridges and making sure um, our, our streets are, uh, are, physically, are physically safe and our buildings and so forth. Um, the genesis and mission is, well, it's evolved a little bit. At the time that the center began, uh, I guess about four years ago, I've been there for two, um, there was just a, uh, the beginnings of a change in looking at how uh, people were, were dealing with development in New York City. And now there's much more of a change. But the, the Bloomberg administration has recognized that, uh, that there, is a, there really has been a massive socioeconomic change in New York in terms of the kinds of industries that New York um, focuses on. New York was the great manufacturing city of the middle of the 20th century, and um, the zoning code reflects that economic reality. The city has evolved, and we are not so much in a, a manufacturing or industrial city, although there are pockets of it. Um, but the zoning code, which dates in its, in its major update to 1961, um, hadn't kept up with that. And so the Bloomberg administration actually has rezoned more of the city. Uh, I think they've calculated that it's a, something like one-sixth of the land mass of New York that, that, that has been rezoned during the Bloomberg administration than any other mayor in the past. And it's a, a recognition of this, this shift. In Away from industrial and manufacturing towards what? Towards, towards um, a more mixed uh, commercial environment. And uh, probably the most dramatic example we see is along uh, the waterfront. You know, New York City is, a, is an archipelago. It's a city of islands, and you know, there are hundreds of miles of waterfront, and for many, many years they were used for um, undesirable purposes, I have to say. You know, people couldn't get access to, to you know, the amazing resource that New York Harbor and the rivers are because there were bus depots and industrial plants train and, tracks, and you know, right. all, all the kinds of things that you right. just fit, you know, are not safe and are not attractive and, and had fallen in many, in many cases into disuse because of that, that huge global economic shift that New York has been part of. And so it was time to change the zoning to allow different uses, uses that would, that would include uh, public access. Right to the waterfront. That's the, most, <clears throat> that's the most dramatic example. There are some other examples. As there well. is so much development going on in New York City right, right now. On e almost every corner, out of every window, you see something going up. Has there ever been a period of such unprecedented uh, plans and hopes other than, say, in the Robert Moses era? I would say probably not. I mean, New York had a, a somewhat you know, straight extension up of growth in, in its earliest days, and certainly back to 1811 when the city commissioners came up with the Manhattan street grid at a time when Manhattan was, 
you know, this big, and but street gridded all the way up the full island, imagining that it would grow, and also eventually, um, you know, leaving leaving room for Central Park, which was, you know, an enormous uh, vision um, when the city was so small. But so there's always been this. There was always this growth until, but then this zoom up in growth and development and infrastructure during the Moses period, and then a shrinkage in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And New York lost population. People moved away. Uh, businesses moved away. And the, and the city actually shrank. Well, New York City's population, its countable population, actually, because there are probably many immigrants, illegal, uh, undocumented immigrants, who are, who are not even counted. But even within its countable population, New York has regained all of that population and more. So we're, we're at our highest population point now, and uh, the projections are that we're going to grow even bigger in the next generation or so by another million people or so. Now, adding a million people to the city of New York is like, you know, adding a couple of cities right. <laughs> to the city of New York. I guess the question is, you know, developing the waterfront, open, opening them up to people. You know, mm -hmm. I love the piers, I love the parks, but, you know, is all of this development good, you know, when you seem to be developing every inch of the city? And residents of neighborhoods tend to be anti-development. Yeah. Well, I think there is, there often is a gut reaction against development. And I'd say that the center's point of view, my point of view, um, is that development per se is neither good nor bad. Um, there, there is good development and there is poor development, but there is a big difference between those two things. And if you are going to develop, you need to provide the structure to support that development. So I, what people, um, I think, largely are reacting to is a history of developing without pri providing the appropriate structures and infrastructure to support that. So pouring more people into a neighborhood without adding transportation service, without adding um, schools, and just allowing more crowding. Um, there are some new issues that are arising now um, that people are concerned about, kind of neighborhood businesses, and are they dri being driven out by, by national chains? Are neighborhoods losing their characters? I mean, it's still the case that New York is remarkably a city of many unique neighborhoods. Uh, but that's a concern. But I think a lot of it has to do with um, New Yorkers feeling that they have been the victim over the last couple of generations of development without the appropriate um, support. And so what role does the center play in, you know, in, in development? And what are some of the projects that you have been involved in? Well, um, I think the major one we wanted to talk to today, uh, talk about today was um, environmental review and, and re rethinking envir environmental review as the name of, of the handbook is. And it goes directly to this, this particular question that we're talking about now. Um, people have heard about environmental reviews, particularly if they're near a development that, they, that that's controversial or um, uh, there's a tendency to uh, use this bureaucratic tool as a way to delay or uh, oppose a project. But it's actually got um, the potential to be very useful for... And this is, we're basically talking about the environmental impact statements. That's that, right. That so there, so there, are, there are, are a couple of different steps to that. There's something called an environmental assessment, and there's something called an environmental impact statement. If a project is big enough for an environmental impact statement, that's kind of a huge thing. Let's talk about that in a moment. Um, but basically, there's this statewide requirement um, for environmental review as a disclosure process. That is, that if there's a project, whether it is a government-sponsored project itself or whether it requires government approval or funding um, in New York State, it has to, there has to be a disclosure process of what that project is going to, what impacts it's going to have on the environment. And the environment is, is, in the state 
statute is is it's somewhat broadly um, defined. You're talking about traffic. You're talking about noise. You're talking about schools. You're, all. Those things, things. Well, when I say broadly defined, it's, <clears throat> it, it includes all of those things. It includes a lot of uh, of other things. For I mean, what we would probably think of as environment are things like air and water, and then what we would call the the infrastructure or the urban fra fabric. You know, how is this? If I bring in 500 people, do I need a new school? Right. Do I need to add bus service? Whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> so there's the state requirement, um, and then there's the city implementation of the state requirement. So there's the state law, which you know has a bunch of requirements. And then in 1977, the city um, came up with its implementation, how it was going to practice this, this you know, put this, this law into effect in the city. And that became kind of even more, um, ha have, ha had even more requirements. And in fact, one of the things it did also was absolve itself from some state requirements. The state requires that uh, state agencies, if they're, ref if they're reviewing a private application, an application from a private developer, that there are certain kind of timetables that they have to respond to the, to the application. There is no, the, the city has absolved itself, its own agencies, and the city implementation of doing that. So, so while in, if you have a state project elsewhere in New York State, you kind of know well, I'm going to hear back from the, age, the reviewing agency in two months. Right. You don't know that in the city. It could be two months. It could be six months. It could be two years. And you know, you're say, staying there. Now, there are projects that really need environmental review and an impact statement and a plan of what you're going to do about those impacts. And then there are other projects that don't. And um, what Rethinking Environmental Review talks about is kind of the distinction between those and how to make the, the process useful so that it moves from just being a disclosure statement, uh, OK, we're going to have these impacts, to actually a planning document. Right now, the requirement is for the applicant to, to disclose the impacts they're going to have. And if they are significant impacts, to make some suggestions on how those impacts, the word is mi mitigated, can be mitigated. You know, how, how you can, if you're going to be adding all these people uh, and, and you're on a bus route, how you're going to, how it's needed that another, another bus run is necessary. Or you're going to add all these people and you need a new elementary school. So it kind of declares that. But there's no requirement, either on the applicant or on any level of government, to actually deliver that mitigation. Right. right. So, you know, so it's almost a planning document, but it's not. It's really a disclosure document. And even if it is a planning document, you actually don't have any guarantee at the other end that you're going to get the changes that are necessary to allow that development to fit into the neighborhood. And it can hold up the, the, the process for a long period of time, cost a lot of money. And then not yield anything. And then not yield anything. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. OK, great. There is really only one boy, one girl, one tree, one forest, one ocean. One mountain, one sky, and one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. Welcome back to One to One. I'm talking with Hope Cohen, Deputy Director of the Manhattan Institute Center for Rethinking Development. So this environmental review process, it's cumbersome, it's expensive, it doesn't accomplish what often what it's supposed to accomplish. How would you change it? What needs to be done instead? Well, what we've suggested is a few things to change. And we're focused really only on the, the city implementation right. of the state law. And we're not getting into changing the state law, which you know, I could argue there are things that, are, that are, need to be changed about the state law, but that's, that's a whole different set of fish. Let's, let's focus on any particular difficulties that we're having to see, any additional burdens. And remember I said before that, that, this, that it's the city's 
Im uh, implementation of right. the state law that has added additional requirements. Well, this this is that. Th this this technical manual is the city's uh, guideline rule book for applicants to to go through the environmental review process. Um, th I mentioned before the environmental assessment. At the state level, that's that's almost a filtering form. It's a two-page form, and you fill it out, and that helps the th that's what allo allows the state agency to determine. Yeah, you have to go on to the next stage and do an environmental impact statement, or no, you don't. In the city, um, the environmental assessment statement can be a huge, expensive project in its own. It can take six months to a year. It can be a book like this. Um, and that's just, again, this determining, determining point about whether the next step right. is necessary. So one thing we suggest is let's, let's go back to the state requirement. Let's say, let's make that filtering the, um, a, a small document and figure out the, at that point whether the large, the large environmental impact statement is, is, is necessary as opposed to going through a large document to, to get there. Um, another thing we say is that that set, set of time limits that I was mentioning. You know, the city shouldn't be absolving itself of the, of the state rules. The, if the state has turnaround requirements for private applicants, the city should, ha should be able to follow those same state guidelines and be able to respond to private applicants in the same manner. Um, we say that the way this book has been written, it captures many projects um, into the process that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. that, that it might be appropriate to capture in some rural area of New York City, State, but is not appropriate to capture um, in the dense fabric of New York City, and that those projects should be exempt. A, spe a specific example of that has to do with subsidized housing, affordable housing, which is, of course, a, you know, a huge um, priority of the administration and of the people of the city of New York. Well, remember what I said before about what gets captured in this process. One of the things that gets captured, one of the, the, the thing that triggers is government funding. So if you have the same project that would be absolutely as of right as of the zone, for the zoning of, in an area, and that same project is market rate and does not have government funding, it does not trigger environmental right. review. If it does have government funding, same exact project as of right, it does, it does trigger it. And this is expensive and time yeah. consuming. So it's actually a uh, disincentive for developers to develop the affordable housing and an incentive for them to, to develop the market. So rate. could the city just exempt? Absolutely. Okay. That, so the, the, <clears throat> that's the focus of our recommendations. Is right. What can the city do without getting Albany involved? What can the city do to at least make the city work better? Mm -hmm. And what we suggest is that they come up with a list of exemptions, something that's specifically allowed in the state legislation that encourages municipalities to come up with its own appropriate list of exemptions from the process. And adhere city, to the state time limits. Adhere to the state time limits. Right. Um, and then do something on the other end about actually making the planning work. And that it shouldn't just be when you do have to do an environmental impact statement and you do have to identify mitigations, that it shouldn't just be an exercise in identifying mitigations, that there should be some way between the applicant and the government of ensuring that the appropriate mitigations actually occur. And you also want certain <laughs> factors left out of the environmental review process, right, that are in now, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that there are some things, again, it goes to how uh, broadly this, this book was written. There are some things that are examined now that actually are interesting to read sometimes about like the, the, the history of the, of the neighborhood and, and things like that, but have nothing to do with um, with the infrastructure so or services. So what would you and what would you leave out? Well, I think I would absolutely include the things we would normally think of as environmental issues. Air quality, transportation, traffic, water quality, um, all of those, you know, things that you think of that make sense to you as, as environmental right. and as affecting um, infrastructure and services. There's a, there's, a, there's a part in there that has to do with you know, is the police protection, is there right. enough cops? You but know? you'd leave out what? But I would leave out um, things about uh, 
impact on um, neighborhood character and um, uh, uh, something that <laughs> there's actually a chapter on, on land use. Um, well, the whole reason you're doing this process is that you have an a, a land use application. And the land use application explains the impact on land use. Right. Why do you have to have it in your environmental mm -hmm. review mm -hmm. um, application as well? So those are the kinds of things. I think there are about a half a dozen things that I suggest that really don't add anything to the planning purposes of mm -hmm. the document. Um, but that goes back to its origin as as a disclosure document. Right, right. So. Now, there's some people who would say, okay, the Manhattan Institute, a conservative think tank, pro-development, mm -hmm. so anything that you can do, any development is good, and some of these, um, you know, the environmental impact statements, the you know, peop communities use these to ward off development that they don't want. And, you know, what would, how would you respond to that? Well, my background is actually in in the community. Before I came f to the to the Manhattan Institute, to the Center for Rethinking Development, and even now, um, I was on Manhattan's Community Board Seven on the Upper West Side. That's actually where I first learned to wade through environmental assessment statements and environmental impact statements. Right. We, we actually had to have to read them sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, to, to review a project, an application. And it's from that experience, because what, what I learned in doing that was I had to read 500-page documents to find the nugget of information <laughs> that actually mattered to the, to the neighborhood that we right. needed to get addressed in the application that, you know, somebody was going to, planning to have, you know, parties on the lawn with amplification and we needed to address that noise issue. That some, that, that, you know, you had to tease out the, the traffic section is almost always important and needs to be there, right? That's, that's like a basic thing, tra traffic and transportation. So you, you could always know to read that chapter, but you had to read all the rest and, and most of it was, um, irrelevant to to anything that would impact us in real life, or that or was technically beyond our capability to review. And that's another thing. There's a when these things get big and complicated enough for a big enough project, that it's often community groups that then have to spend a fortune and con hire consultants and lawyers of their own right. to read read and interpret the documents. So there's 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 almost there's uh, there has gotten over the years to be this this uh, arms race really between between applicants and uh, opponents of projects where applicants throw absolutely everything they can think of into the document to protect themselves to from a, law a right, lawsuit right, right. and and then and then opponents have to you know spend you know tons of time and effort and resources and money to try to find things that actually matter. Right. What additional kinds of development does the city, I mean, what are the most pressing areas of development the city needs to be addressing at this particular point in time, as you see it? Well, of course, the mayor, you know, came out famously almost a, a year ago with a huge um, vision for New York called Plan YC, looking to, you know, what's necessary for the year 2030, assuming that population growth we were talking about before, adding the million people. And, you know, basically there are three themes of that. One, one is... But you don't have time since we have two minutes. But, I mean, in terms of, you know, the, if you had to, one, two, three, prioritize what things you want to see the city move towards. I think that as a theme, we have to move toward building the infrastructure to support what we've got now and to allow the way we're going to grow. And I right. think that's really what, what Plan YC, on the, big, on the highest level, is trying to do, but with an environmental component as well. Right. The third, third thing I was and say. you see congestion pricing as one way of financing that, correct? I, yes. I think some, some form of pricing, I, didn't, um, I don't know that, I don't think that the, the mayor's exact proposal is the most efficient way to go, but some way of pricing um, the use of the streets by drivers in order to finance the maintenance and expansion of the infrastructure that we need um, is necessary. 
Uh, what we have right now is, um, is a situation where the city's own infrastructure tends to be in worse condition than infrastructure that is that has a revenue stream. In, in particular, I'm using the, the exact right. analogy of uh, the exact example of, of bridges. So we've got the so-called free bridges along the um, East River, which aren't really free because we are paying for them in our taxes. But we're not paying enough because because they are in disrepair. We've we've spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, billions actually, in the last generation to essentially rebuild them because they had not been right. maintained. And we have you know examples of other bridges run by other. Uh, entities in the area, the MTA and the Port Authority, that do have a revenue stream, and guess what? They're in great shape. Right, right. And not only are they in great shape, but but those authorities use a, um, the additional revenues that more than pays for them being in great shape. The additional revenues to subsidize public transportation, right, right. and that's really what we need to do. The thing that makes New York actually uniquely an environmental. Um, giant among among the country, and uh, and why environmentally it's actually a good thing for the city to grow, is that we are being so dense and compact. We are environmentally responsible just by virtue of that, because we are close together and we walk and we use public transportation right. and and all of those things that makes us actually the by far the most environmentally efficient and energy efficient uh, place in the nation. Hope this is a very complicated subject and very interesting, and I wish we had more time. They keep talking about it, but we're out of time, so we're going to have to have you back. Okay, so that'd we be can great. Talk about, we can talk about more of this and go through these two big books. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My thanks to Hope Cohen of the Center for Rethinking Development at the Manhattan Institute for joining us. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.